Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. The five years I spent at the Reserve Bank was a very turbulent period for the global economy, for the Indian economy. We had one crisis after another, the global financial crisis, an inflation crisis, the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis, the exchange rate crisis triggered by the taper tantrums. I thought my experiences, my successes, and my failures would have some value for future policymakers. I also wrote the book because I wanted to demystify the Reserve Bank. Most people think of the Reserve Bank as a mysterious institution that does mysterious things unconnected with everyday life. So I wrote that book in order to communicate to the larger public what impact the Reserve Bank has on their everyday lives. In his book, Just a Mercenary, Duvuri Subarao chronicles his career between two extremes. Back in 1974, at the start of his career as sub-collector of Parvati Puram in Andhra Pradesh, he learned the hard way that more than enthusiasm, tribal development requires an understanding of poverty. Forty years later, as the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, amidst a fierce exchange rate crisis, he learned about the harsh challenges of an emerging economy in an unequal world. In this episode, Duvuri Subaro discusses his journey between Parvatipura and the Reserve Bank of India with M. S. Sri Ram, Professor at the Center for Public Policy at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. This episode is adapted from an event that took place in June of 2024 at the Bangalore International Center. Let me start by telling you a story. I became Governor of the Reserve Bank of India on the 5th of September 2008. 5th of September 2008 is a significant day in the history of world finance not because i became governor but because of the tumultuous events that happened in the weeks following 5th of September 2008 5th of September i became governor 7th of September Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac two housing mortgage companies in the US went bankrupt 8th of September Merrill Lynch vanished 10th of September countrywide a large commercial bank in the US melted down 12th of September AIG the largest insurance company in the world came to the brink of a meltdown 13th of September Wachovia and uh, Washington Mutual nearly vanished 15th of September 2008 Lehman Brothers collapsed the collapse of Lehman Brothers on the 15th of September 2008 plunged the world into a very deep financial crisis a devastating crisis that took toll on growth and welfare all around the world governments central bankers policy makers everywhere were concerned panicked anxious about what to do financial markets went into a tizzy with fear and panic people all over were worried about their money that crisis those tremors which started in the subprime sector of the us with the collapse of lehman brothers recosted around the world every country in the world was affected by that crisis so was india our growth slumped the rupee went volatile markets panicked all our markets our money market currency market equity market bond market went into a tizzy but in india there was dismay disbelief denial about why we should be affected by the crisis the narrative was that that crisis should affect America Europe where the banks had indulged in excesses they had toxic assets they had done subprime lending their regulators were sleeping at the wheel but in India our banks were well behaved they had no toxic assets they had been responsible our regulators kept the financial system on track why should we be affected so the story that got constructed was that this new governor came and brought on the crisis so wherever i went people would ask me sir when will the crisis be over i didn't have an answer nobody on the planet had an answer to that question but nevertheless since i couldn't defend myself i'd play along with that and say since you people thought that i brought on the crisis 
the crisis will end when my term would be over. <laughs> and for good measure, I would tell them when my term would be over. But here's the thing. The week after I left the RBI, the crisis ended. Growth started going up, inflation started going down, the rupee stabilized, the economy got back on track. It was baptism by fire for me. Why am I telling you that story? It's part of my book, though, but I'm telling you that story because it illustrates an important transition in India's history, transition of our economy from a closed economy to an open economy. That transition had an enormous impact it had uh, taken a toll on our economy, but what's the transition got to do with the book? As I wrote in the foreword to that book, I wrote the book as random notes. I didn't have an overarching theme around it, just as they came to me, as memories came to me. But now that the book is a finished product, when I read it all together, I realized that I can build a theme around it, reverse engineer a theme as it were. I can tell my story, in several ways, and one of the themes in which I can tell the story is as transitions that I saw in my life and career. So that was a significant transition. The other transition that I saw in my career was a transition from gender disparity to gender parity. We've seen it around the world, in India, there's more gender sensitivity, there's more gender equality now. 15 years ago, I was on a flight and not taken off, there was the pre-flight announcement by the captain. There was a person sitting next to me, he was a stranger, I didn't know him. He said to me, if I had a chance, I'll get off the plane now. I said, why? It's a woman who is piloting the plane. This morning, when I was flying into Bangalore, the pilot was a woman, and we were completely nonchalant about it. So that's an illustration of uh, the transition from gender disparity to gender parity. All around the country, you see that girls' aspirations have gone up. I went to a function the other day, uh, some 15-year-old girl. She said, sir, can I take a selfie with you? I said, sure. And then after the selfie, I said, what do you want to be? I thought she would say, I want to be an IAS officer like you. I want to be an RBI governor like you. She said, bursted my ego, she said, I want to be an astronaut like Sunita Williams. So girls today, they want to be IAS officers, IPS officers. They want to be finance sector professionals, corporate executives. They want to be doctors, engineers, journalists, professors. They want to be Kalpana Chavla, Indira Nuis, Gita Gopinaths. So let me talk about gender parity in the civil services that I saw. In the civil services, we can look at gender parity at a time of recruitment and in career management. There's been a remarkable transition from disparity to parity over the last 50 years, both at the time of recruitment and in career management, but we've not the best practice yet. In the first two decades of independence after the IAS started, women were just a trickle. In the 60s, in the 70s, they were just about 9% of uh, women in the IAS intake. When I joined the IAS in 1972, just 15% of our batch were women. Today, I believe about 25% of women. That's not complete parity, but significant improvement. We cannot declare victory yet. But on career management, again, there has been improvement, but we've got a long way to go. There used to be some positions in the government stereotyped as for women, and some positions stereotyped as not for women, only for men. Up until the late 70s, women were not even being posted as collectors of districts. You know, being the collector of a district is the defining position of an IAS career. In fact, in my parents' generation, you did not become an IAS officer. You became a collector. So that way, women were not being posted as collectors. But two years ago, I saw a picture, a small note in the paper, that of the 14 districts in Kerala, 10 had women as collectors. So we're getting to gender parity in terms of uh, career management as well. But... Still, we've not had a woman cabinet secretary so far, the topmost position in the civil service. But if you look at gender parity in the larger world, you would see that there has been improvement as well. It used to be said that if poverty has a gender, it is female. If poverty has a face, it is that of a girl child. But that's changed quite a lot. 
50 years ago, when I used to go to villages, I used to see girls come around the jeep, skimpily clad girls, ashen faces, shallow cheeks, anemic eyes, vacant looks. Today, if you go into the hinterland of the country, one of the sights you will see is of well-fed, well-clad girls, healthy-looking girls, in uniform, going to schools on cycle. So there's been a remarkable improvement from gender disparity to gender parity. And that is a tribute, in some sense, to what the IAS has done, what the country has done. Take education, for example, primary education. The challenges are, as education specialists say, three. Enrollment, retention, and achievement. We've cracked enrollment, 100% now. Largely because of efforts by governments, but also because one of the great things we've done, the midday meal program, I'm very proud of what we do in the midday meal program in India. Giving a hot meal to hundreds of millions of children every workday afternoon is a phenomenal thing, unprecedented anywhere in the world. Because of that, we've cracked enrollment. Retention used to be a problem, especially for girls. They used to drop out for other reasons. Also because one of the reasons was that there were no toilets for girls. So there was a massive program 15, 20 years ago to build toilets for girls in schools. So retention, we've achieved. Achievement levels are still poor. Poor for boys, poorer for girls. We've got to crack that. I was spent a few months at Yale University last year, and Yale had a big program to get girls to enroll in STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics streams. I think we should have some program like that to get girls into STEM. When I joined IIT in dark ages, of course, we used to be 1,500 boys and 15 girls. You know, That's one is to 100 ratio. So on gender disparity to gender parity transition, let me tell you a story of my own, how I got sensitized. Uh, when I was a mid-level official uh, in the Ministry of Finance in Delhi, I had uh, some experience. You know, one of the tasks of uh, Delhi bureaucracy is answering parliament questions. When you have a parliament question, it takes a lot of uh, effort of the bureaucracy to get the answer approved by the minister, then or to prepare the notes for the minister to answer in the parliament, and then make copies, etc. So we had a parliament question. Uh, we had gone through the intellectual part of the work, preparing the answer, preparing the notes. The minister had approved the note. All that was done by about 9 p.m. What was left to be done was the legwork of you know, making copies and sending them off to the parliament house, etc. That job is that of the undersecretary. My undersecretary at that time was a woman, so I told her, Rita, why didn't you go home? It has got quite late. I'm going home myself. I've had someone else do this work for you. Her face suddenly became red, you know. Uh, she flustered, flushed, and uh, somewhat angry. And she said in as firm a tone as a person can tell her boss two levels above her, so if you don't mind, I'll stay and do my work. I thought she would appreciate my being considerate to her, but she was resenting my being patronizing towards her. So that's a lesson I learned in, uh, in gender sensitivity. So several transitions I could tell my story in. One I told you from a closed economy to an open economy, from gender disparity to gender parity, from the Hindu rate of growth to becoming the fastest growing large economy in the world today, from a country once synonymous with mass deprivation, to becoming a country, low middle income country, which has all but eliminated extreme poverty, a transition from uh, an agricultural economy to becoming the byword for digitally driven service economy, a transition from docile federalism to contentious federalism, as we've been seeing over the last two days after the parliament election results. So I could tell my story in terms of those transitions. But that's not what I, why I wrote the book. Let me tell you in five minutes why I wrote the book. Some of you might know that my earlier book, Who Moved My Interest Rate, narrating my experiences as the governor of the Reserve Bank, that came out in 2016, about two and a half years after I left the Reserve Bank. That was the first governors before me and governors after me have written books, but mine was the first 
book of a complete tenure of a governor. And that book was motivated by a strong sense of purpose. First, because the five years I spent at the Reserve Bank was a very turbulent period for the global economy, for the Indian economy. We had one crisis after another, the global financial crisis, an inflation crisis, the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis, the exchange rate crisis triggered by the taper tantrums. I thought my experiences, my successes, and my failures would have some value for future policymakers. I also wrote the book because I wanted to demystify the Reserve Bank. Most people think of the Reserve Bank as a mysterious institution that does mysterious things unconnected with everyday life. So I wrote that book in order to communicate to the larger public what impact the Reserve Bank has on their everyday lives. That book found an audience, and to my pleasant surprise, much larger audience than I expected. Many people who read that book, especially youngsters, said, sir, why didn't you write a book on your entire IAS career? I pushed back against that suggestion for many reasons. First, civil service memoirs are now a crowded journal. Lots of people have written. And they span the entire spectrum in terms of quality. They're poor quality books, the mediocre, and the high quality outstanding books. The outstanding books have been outstanding because the authors have been able to tell their story, weave their story into the cultural, economic, and social history of the country. I was not confident that my story and the way I tell it would pass muster by those benchmarks. I was also diffident because I joined the IAS in 1972, dark ages from today's perspective, more than 50 years ago. There's a different context, different milieu, I was not sure that my stories would have any relevance or would have any resonance with today's audience. They might be quaint, you know, like struggles with a landline phone in today's uh, instant connectivity. But beyond that, I was not sure that my story would have any value. Perhaps the most important reason that I pushed back was that I kept no notes. And jogging through 50 years of memory uh, looked like a very daunting prospect. There is the risk of selective memory that it should embellish your accomplishments and uh, minimize your failures. But during the COVID lull, devoid of other distractions, I started writing. Mostly I thought I'd write some notes for my children after I go, my go sometime, they'll read them. And then Urmila, I goaded her to read some of them. But when she read them, she said uh, she encouraged me to bite the bullet and write the book. But then COVID ended and the world reopened. There were other distractions, so it became very labored writing. That product is what we're discussing today. One last thought. Several people over the last 10 years since I stepped down from the Reserve Bank and over the last one month since the book has come out, people have asked me, how come you got from the IAS to the Reserve Bank? Now, I struggle to answer that question. If I just said, look, it's uh, just a question of being at the right place at the right time, it would come across as false modesty. On the other hand, if I said, look, it's a testimonial, then my competence, my experience, my track record, I'll sound boastful and boorish. So I try to combine those two and give an unsatisfactory answer. Perhaps this book will give a nuanced answer, but I'm not sure. That's not why I wrote the book. This is not meant to be a guidebook. I wrote the book, and I hope you enjoy reading it, and I hope that some of my stories would resonate with your own experiences. I have read the book, so that's the first claim that I need to make. Because several times uh, you find in the press uh, people interviewing the author and said, oh, I just got the book yesterday, I've not read it fully, but uh, nevertheless, can you answer the following question? So I've actually read the book. Dr. Subarao has a very innate sense of humor which doesn't come across very clearly when he speaks and uh, the book has a whole lot of those so let's try and get a little bit of some of these incidents because uh, he's sort of put a larger canvas to the book but there are smaller tidbits in the book which are very interesting nevertheless let's start with the first question is a little personal when you read the book you come across as a sort of a lonely person in the sense that the inspiration that you talk about is about your parents, but we don't find too many friends of IIT coming across, too many associates of IAS uh, coming across in the book, or 
you know, exchanging your views. And you come with a lot of values already associated with you, but you're not discussing those values with any of your peers or anything, at least in the book. I'm not sure, because uh, nobody has evaluated me like that before. I'm both embarrassed, impressed, and also somewhat uncomfortable with that evaluation. But yeah, I am, uh, compared to many other people, I'm quite a self-contained person. In fact, after I left the RBI, I used to go to Singapore quite frequently, lived there over extended periods. And uh, then uh, people say, how can you live in Singapore? Singapore is a very nice place to live in. You know? But uh, there's not much to, not much you can do outside of your apartment. You can go out and eat every day. You can go to a shopping mall every day. But then I used to say, I'm quite a self-contained person. I'm okay. You know, I, I'm uh, okay going to the university, sitting in my room and talking to some students and uh, then coming and eating in my apartment. So quite a self-contained person. I, uh, I don't know if you want to call that solitude. What is the question about values? I'm not sure. It's a judgment that other people should make of you. You can't evaluate your own values. You start your story with the Parvati Puram, and you've talked about Parvati Puram uh, in other occasions uh, as well. And you talk about waiting for the monsoon there. When you started off your career, Reserve Bank used to have only two credit policies. One was uh, busy season and the other was slack season, and both was dependent on the monsoon. By the time you came to Reserve Bank, there were six monetary policies. Has our dependence on monsoon reduced and has the Reserve Bank evolved over a period of time? How do you see this generally from Parvati Puram to Reserve Bank of India? Thank you. That's a good question to start this conversation. You know, it's very appropriate that we talk about monsoon in the first week of June because the entire nation is waiting for the monsoon. Monsoon is celebrated in our country like in no other countries uh, all over South Asia, especially in India. All our uh, autumn festivals are in some sense related to monsoon, most notably Onam in Kerala. So we celebrate monsoon. It has an emotional connect with people. Some years ago, I used to be very fond of reading travel books. And there's one book called Chasing the Monsoon by Alexander Freiter. It says a New Zealander who travels across the country, starting in southwest Kerala, all across to the northeast, and then goes off into Myanmar. He goes chasing the monsoon, sometimes behind the monsoon, sometimes ahead of the monsoon. It's a very well-written book. In fact, I stole the title of the chapter from that book. So monsoon has an emotional connect. But I realized, when I look back on my life and career, that monsoon also has an economic connect with uh, all of us, especially with uh, the career of a public official. You know, like most people, I had no exposure to Willis' life before uh, I joined the IAS and got my first posting. So as a student, as I was growing up, you look forward to the monsoon after the intense heat of the summer, but after the first rains, the rains over subsequent months become a nuisance because your roads are flooded, your roofs are leaking, your clothes are wet, and you treat the monsoon as a nuisance. But when I became an IAS officer, went to Parvatipuram as sub-collector, I realized that monsoon has an intimate connect with the agricultural economy and therefore the economy of the country. You know, but there was a drought in the very first year, and I realized how much we had to do as public officials to mitigate the impact of drought on the people. And so subsequently, in whatever, all along my career, whether I was doing promoting industries or doing balance of payments, Monsoon had a connection with our economy. We talk about drought proofing, but even today, in 2024, we're still dependent on the monsoon. But when I went to the Reserve Bank in 2010, I went to the Reserve Bank in 2008, and like I said, there was the global financial crisis. We had run an easy money policy. By early 2010, the question was, when would we exit from that policy? The big debate in the economic media was, when will the Reserve Bank exit from that policy? So I went to Thiruvananthapuram for the RBI board meeting in the last week of May, and there was the nation, and Kerala was waiting for the monsoon. And the, there was a media conference, and one of the reporters asked me, sir, are you going to tweak your policy depending on the monsoon? So uh, it was a very involved question about how delayed monsoon might affect inflation, which might in turn affect the credit policy, monetary policy. But I didn't want to get into all that. I just said, uh, like uh, millions of people across the country, uh, the Reserve Bank and I as governor were also chasing the monsoon. 
And uh, they all clapped. They thought I'd answered the question. But, you know, subsequently somebody wrote a nice story about that. It is like, uh, you know, the governor sitting with a group of villagers under a village tree looking skywards for guidance on monetary policy. So this is a very nice story, the allegory on that. But monsoon has an intimate connect with our economy in spite of agriculture being a very small proportion of the GDP, but 50% of the labor is still in agriculture. So monsoon has a very, very deep connect with our economic performance. Let me remain with monsoons. You know, there is a sense of poetry in monsoons. You know, there's a lot of poetry written about monsoons as, uh, as well. There's an expectation, sometimes it comes on time, sometimes it uh, doesn't, there's an uncertainty, sometimes there's excess. You don't know which trajectory it's leading to. Your career also seems to have followed a monsoon-like pattern. Because when you read the book, there are two attempts to do a PhD in between, and you, know, you sort of resign to it and come back. So all these roller coasters are there. Yeah, first I want to say that my career, my life is not unique in that sense. Everybody has ups and downs. Nobody goes up in a straight line, upward sloping straight line. No career, no life goes that way. So my life, my experience was not unique. But since you instigated me to talk about my own career, I had my ups and downs in terms of postings, in terms of performance, in terms of appreciation or lack of appreciation for what I had done or what I had not done. When I was posted by NTR as an officer on special duty for Eric Bottling. I thought that was a career setback. I, my career was finished. I had applied for some jobs in the World Bank. I did not get them. I thought, uh, you know, what is this? I've done so well in the IAS. I can't get into a World Bank job. I had not gotten some postings. I, when I was trying to get into the government of India, I had uh, at least seven years of experience at the state level in industrial promotion. I thought they'd welcome me with open arms. There was a job opening there, they did not take me. So I had my own share of setbacks, and those setbacks looked very big in real time. When I look back from this distance of time, they're small blips, and I'm sure that that's the experience of everyone. I mean, how does it look for a governor of Reserve Bank to have in a CV, I was the chief of Arak Bottling Company? How did that experience go? Obviously, you say that when the first thing was you were depressed uh, when that assignment came to you, but then you sort of started looking at it as a job that you ultimately went on seeing meaning in what you were doing? I'm a unique in the sense that I was the first and probably the last governor who would ever have had experience in bottling liquor. <laughs> but that's the way it is. But let me tell you that story, which is that NTR became our chief minister for the first time in the mid-1980s. He was a teetotaler. Not only was he a teetotaler, but he had contempt for people who drank. And he was pained by thousands of people who were dying because they were drinking adulterated liquor. He wanted to impose prohibition, but the finance department people said, so we can't do that uh, because we will lose revenue, and if we lose that tax revenue, we can't implement your other schemes, etc. So we had to cave in, we had to acquiesce in that. So he said, if I can't impose prohibition, the second best is that I will have bottling plants for liquor government bottling plants for liquor in every district of the state so that when people drink, they know that this is unadulterated liquor. At least I can control people drinking adulterated liquor. So that was decided on. And they posted me as an officer on special duty for Arak bottling. I don't know if they use the same word here in Canada, but yeah, yeah Arak bottling. And my first reaction was, why me? I had no experience in excise department. I had shown no flair for any project implementation, much less for bottling liquor. There for 250 to 300 IAS officers, why did they pick on me? I felt like I was being set up for failure. You can't set up 23 Arak bottling plants, one in each district, in nine months. And when you go to a social event, a wedding in your family, people ask you, what are you doing? I'm bottling liquor. You know, you see the IAS toppers interviews in the newspapers every year. Why do you want to join the IAS? I want to change the world. And I joined the IAS, I'm bottling liquor. So I was devastated. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was distraught. I went home and brooded for one week. But then I decided that if I have to do it, I will do it. And then I got together a team. And in that story, I write in the book. But in the event, we accomplished the job 
three days before the deadline, we had bottling plants in each of the 23 districts of the state ready to go, commissioned, fully staffed, all missionary, all systems in place. Give me a tremendous sense of accomplishments. And the lessons I learned from was, first I learned that uh, I shouldn't be vain. You know, thinking that I am destined for bigger things than bottling liquor. That vanity was uncalled for. Second, I learned that uh, being pushed out of your comfort zone can be an enormous learning experience. Don't fear failure. If you fail, failure can be a big lesson. Being pushed out is a very, very big, valuable learning experience. The third lesson I learned is this, that if you go to a leadership seminar or read some of these uh, self-help books, what do they tell you? If you want to succeed in life, discover your passion and pursue it. I realized that that doesn't work most of the time. Most of the time, you don't have the opportunity to pursue your passion. My passion might be playing the piano, but if I'm a black piano player, I can't make a living out of that. So you don't always have the opportunity to pursue your passion. The lesson I learned was that whatever you have to do, do it with passion. So that's the third lesson I learned from that experience. Any officer of your vintage from the AP cadre, we can't but ask the question, how was NTR as a chief minister? I'm sure you would have your own stories of NTR, uh, early morning meetings, a whole lot of things. I remember I used to be a young officer at that time in Hyderabad and I had a roommate who was a journalist. And my job was to drop him in the camp office of NTR in Abbots so that he could go for a press conference at 6 o'clock in the morning. He didn't have a bike, I had a bike. And NTR was a very unique politician, uh, both in terms of his political trajectory, his worldview, and his legacy. Political trajectory is unique in the sense that there's been no politician, and there probably will not be a politician, who started the Greenfield political party and came to office within nine months. And similarly, his political career ended in a very maverick way, you know, you know because of a family feud. It was somewhat sad, but uh, so it's a very unusual political trajectory, both his rise and his fall. His worldview was also very unique, and sometimes it is endearing, sometimes it's irritating. Entia spent all his adult life in movies in Chennai, and he lived in a tunnel. He had no exposure to the real world. So he came from that straight into being the chief minister. There was a big, big difference for him. And he saw the world only in black and white. There was only binary, you know. Sriram is all good, Subarov is all bad. It's not that Sriram is some good, some bad, Subarov is some good, some bad. He's good, I'm bad. So he had a binary view of the world. And uh, he had a moralistic perspective of everything. I, I'll, let me give an example of that. I told you you wanted to impose prohibition. And uh, we in the finance department uh, used to tell him, uh, plead with him, sir, we can't do that because we need the money. Then he would say, how come Gujarat is able to live without excise revenue? We had an answer for that. We said, sir, Gujarat is an industrialized state. They get more per capita commercial tax than we. We can't compete with them until we are industrialized like them. And we also said that you want to promote industry here. Uh, if you impose prohibition, Andhra will become unattractive for corporate executives. So we can't impose prohibition. And then he would say, you, you would equate in that, but uh, he would say, how come Gujarat is industrialized? There's no answer to that. So he thought that this officer suggests pushing back against this suggestion, the bad, evil bureaucracy. And uh, he, in his own moralistic perspective, the relative prosperity of Gujarat relative to Andhra is because Gujarat had prohibition and Andhras were drinking. So that's his uh, worldview. And in terms of legacy, I think last year in Andhra, they celebrated NTR centenary and there was a recall of his legacy. And from a distance of time, uh, you can evaluate the legacy in more concrete terms. He'd done things that no calculating politician would have done. For example, it abolished the village officer system. No politician would have done that because chief ministers are very calculated. He had ended the capitation system and he had given inheritance rights under the Hindu Succession Act 25 years before the National Act was amended. 
So NTR had left a great legacy because he was not calculating like a politician. So that's a long he answer. He also to abolished the council. Uh, yeah, he abolished the legislative, legislative council. council yes. Also. yes. So many maverick things he had done because he was not a conventional politician. And, of course, asserted a lot of the state rights uh, in the... Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Federalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. NTR came to prominence. His political platform was built on the anti-center stance. Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister, uh, you know, very centralizing prime minister, and most Congress chief ministers owed allegiance to her. And NTR came as a strong anti-center platform asserting the sovereignty of the states. Another of his legacies is to let people know across the country the diversity of history, tradition, cultures, languages in peninsular India. So many legacies that he left behind. So I'll move to the familiar and controversial stuff, which is your uh, tenure as the RBI governor. When you came in, uh, the general chatter was that you were a plant of Chinambaram or the finance ministry in RBI. By the time you left, I mean, at least the perception was you, uh, you were daggers drawn with the finance ministry. And uh, there was a sense that you became a victim of the technocracy of RBI. How did you look at RBI when you were finance secretary? And did you, in fact, become a victim of the technocracy? Uh, I don't know about victim of technocracy, but Chidambaram always used to tell me after I became governor and when he was finance minister, Subaru, you're becoming hostage to the RBI technocracy, uh, which in some sense, you know, from an outsider perspective, it is probably true. But uh, your question is about whether how I read the job of the governor from within the finance ministry and how I read the job when I was actually the governor. There was a big difference, certainly. I was the finance secretary. I was not any other secretary in government of India. I was finance secretary on the board of the RBI as finance secretary. So I had some exposure to the RBI, but even I was not sensitive to the autonomy of the central bank, how the central bank should be left autonomous or the need for it, how it adds to the value of public policy and to economic stability. But when I went into the Reserve Bank, I had understood the nuances of that. So today I'm unique in some sense that I had seen both the government and the RBI. There were other finance secretaries who'd become governors, very illustrious uh, predecessors, Dr. Y. V. Reddy, Mr. Venkata Ramanan, uh, Dr. Bimal Jalan, etc. But uh, I was the first finance secretary who'd become, you know, like I was finance secretary, within 24 hours I was governor. So I was a serving finance secretary to become governor. So the transition for me was very, very different. My exposure was also very different. So I believe that within the government, there is not adequate appreciation of or sensitivity to the need for the autonomy of regulators, particularly the autonomy of the central bank. If there's media, I know that'll be the headline tomorrow, but, but the headline is all elections now. So let me come back to the title of the book. You know, why did you give this name? I mean, because none of your choices seem to be made on the basis of money or what sort of compensation. In fact, a large part of the book is frustration that you're not getting your choices. And when you start getting your choices, you do make the choices, but it's not about money. So why this title? Because I'm told that you're very careful about how you communicate. I mean, uh, there's a recent book by Alpana Kilawala, which gives some insights about it. Yeah, about the title of the book, money is important to me, but not the most important thing to me. That uh, upfront, I want to say it is important, but it's not the most important thing. But by the title, I'd considered a few other alternatives. I consulted my family, including Urmila, and we narrowed in on this. The reason is this, that when I look back on my life and my career, I find that this country has given me so much. You now, we all crib about the country, about how this is unequal, biased, we don't get lack of opportunities, etc. But when I look back on my life dispassionately, I find that this country has given me so much. I went to a Sainik school with a government scholarship. I went to an IIT, again studied with a government scholarship. I got into the IAS because it is a meritocratic system. I got to become the governor of the Reserve Bank because of, I think, meritocracy, warts and all. So this country has given me so much. In every assignment I had, I tried to do my best. Partly because I was getting paid for it, yes, and you have a sense of responsibility because you're getting paid for it, 
So out of diligence, out of a sense of responsibility, you do your best. But the thought that always ran in my mind was that, am I being driven? Am I being motivated just because I'm getting paid for it? Or am I being driven by a higher calling to give back to society for all that I have received? That's the dilemma that I face in the eighth decade of my life. And that is reflected in the title of this book. You know, if you're a civil servant, particularly, you have your own icons in state civil services. You know, for example, if you're somewhere in Karnataka, people would say Chiranjeev Singh, you know, well-known civil servant sort of thing. In the undivided Andhra, you had Yugandar, you had SR Shankar and BPR Vittal, TL Shankar and so on. What do these people mean to young civil servants and... And some of them are really larger than life in terms of their uh, reputation. Some of them you learn from them just by watching them, not because they're trying to train you or teach you. But some like Uganda would also teach you. Uganda, you know, all along, I worked with him for an extended period, would also take on the job of not teaching you or training you in a very overt way, you know, but uh, pushing you in the right direction. Just let me give you an example. When I was... In the AP Small Scale Industries Development Corporation, Uganda was MD, I was the executive director. One morning about 11 o'clock, he burst into my office. He said, Subha, what are you doing? I said, sir, I'm reading a report on Sikh industries. Sikh industries. I was not reading a novel. I was reading a report about Sikh industries. He said, you shouldn't be wasting your time reading uh, reports. You should go out into the field and see. He didn't say it in so many words, you know. He said, Subha, why didn't you go to Rajamandri next week? And uh, Rajamandri is known for foundry industry, and that's not doing very well. Why don't you go and find out what's wrong with that? And that's a way of telling you that, look, reading reports is okay. That's not that necessary, but not sufficient. Don't spend too much time. This is the time to go out into the field and look. So there is uh, learning from looking at seniors' role models. For example, Mr. Vagul, who passed away. And many obituaries have been written. I, I didn't know Mr. Vogel very well. I had run into him on a couple of occasions. I had interacted with him, but not very well. But from the many obituaries that have been written about him, I saw that he was a role model. Many of the senior bankers today, whom you respect and uh, look up to, they all talk about Mr. Vogel, how he was a role model for them. So I think seniors do have a very significant influence and they must take their job quite uh, seriously. You know, there was this news when you retired from Governor Reserve Bank of India and you came back to Hyderabad that you were unable to open an account. Obviously, that was sensational and you were a victim of the rules that you yourself had set up. It would have been quite easy for you to call up MD of the bank and open an account. Why did you want to be an ordinary person and why did you not use the privilege? There's also this, Alpana has written about uh, your last leave travel concession, which you did by second class compartment, traveling all over Eastern India. Why? Why do you want to subject yourself to this, having had the privilege? We didn't travel second class, we traveled second AC, but anyway. <laughs> but the story about the bank account is that uh, I was governor, and then I was returning to Hyderabad after nearly 20 years. I had to open a bank account, and they asked for address proof. I'd just come back one week. I had no document to show, no gas connection, no telephone connection, no driving license, no nothing to show. And they said, we need an address proof. And a lot of uh, people who learned about it were gleeful that the governor himself is a victim of all the rules he prepared. Done. But then, like you said, it would have been easy for me to circumvent the rule or tell them that who I was. Uh, don't you know I was the governor and all that? But then I thought, let the system take its own route. About travel. RBI allows you to use the LTC even six months after you retired. So for about 25 years, as I moved up the civil service ladder and became the governor, I led a very sanitized life, you know, traveling in uh, airplanes all the time, sitting in air-conditioned offices, not uh, dirtying my hands, not sweating enough, not being on the streets of India. So I, as much as I did try to expose myself, there were limitations. For example, uh, when I was in the RBI, I was returning home one evening. I told the driver to stop in Colaba. I said, you wait here. I just want to go and buy something. I got lost in the car. I didn't come back for 15 minutes. The driver called the protocol officer, and the governor has gone somewhere. He's not come back. Okay? So it, it was a nuisance for me to, you know, go out like that. So 
When I left the Reserve Bank, I and I thought we should desanitize ourselves. So the LTC was there. There's the Vivek Express, which is the longest distance train in the country. It travels from Dibruga to Kanyakumari, I believe. Now the travels goes beyond Dibruga. But when we travel in 2014 or 15, from Dibruga to Kanyakumari, four nights and three days, we took that train, wonderful experience, to see the ebb and flow of life across India. And uh, that exposure, I, you know, I really loved. Uh, I used to be a train buff. I, at one time, I used to be quite familiar with all the major railway platforms in the country when I was a student, but I'd forgotten all that. This was an opportunity to reacquaint myself with uh, the Indian Railways and with India, and with Bharat, actually. Thank you. You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Center. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarona Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.